Goodbye and Hello, Tim's second studio album, was conceived along similarly grandiose lines. The sessions began on the 8th of May 1967 at Western Recorders. When somebody's that gifted and has that good of material, the production is real easy, basically. It's just, it's fun. It's, uh, it's not a lot of work. So, uh, and it was real obvious that's, that's what Tim was. So, um, what I try and do is just uh, bring that out, not get in the way of it. And if I, if I have an idea, throw it out there. And if it, if it's, if it takes, it takes, you know, that, but that's kind of the way it was. And uh, uh, there were so many different kind of things on the album. We had a really good time making it. Uh, it was basically Beckett, uh, Buckley, Beckett, and I, because uh, those two were inseparable at the time. Jerry Esther did a wonderful job as a producer there, helping Tim arrange the songs, put strings on, um, and just really did a, a great job in kind of guiding the sessions, having several takes. Uh, for, for the various tunes. Uh, then Tim rose to the fore magnificently well. The antique people are down in the dungeons Run by machines and afraid of the tax Their heads at the grave and their hands on their eyes Hauling their hearts around circular tracks Pretending forever I think goodbye and hello is, in a certain sense, Tim Buckley's peak because it has a great variety within the record, but it's at the same time very much taking some of the best musical influences of its time and making something very personal out of it. What holds Goodbye and Hello together from start to finish is its ambition. It's trying to articulate the voice of a generation from start to finish. There are songs about the war and Vietnam was just developing at that time. The title song is trying to be this statement about the conflict between the older generation and the kids of the 60s. And so there are a lot of big picture ideas in, on that record that Tim didn't really go back to after that. A lot of that came from Larry Beckett. One of these highly ambitious songs was the opening track, No Man Can Find the War. Inside Pop, the rock revolution continues. Waters fly like bullet stream. And cannons, laugh aloud. No Man Can Find the War is really interesting to listen to now. You know, I mean, I think with Iraq and everything else that's going on, it's a song I think that's, that's held up surprisingly well. You know, it's, it's a protest song, but not one that's ripped out of the newspaper. You know, this is, there's even you know, a kind of uh, almost metaphysical quality that it has that deepens it. I felt that a lot of the protest against the Vietnam War was not against war, but against the Vietnam War as being somehow dishonorable or impractical or whatever, uh, politically wrong-headed. I don't know what they were thinking. And to us, our view was that war itself is, is an atrocious way to solve a, a human problem. So when I wrote No Man Can Find the War, it was that people seem to be working on curing the symptom while the disease flourishes. Singers see and poets wail All the world knows the score But no man can find the war. No Man Can Find the War is kind of the other end of the spectrum for me. I, I kind of had to hold back the giggles a little bit on that one. I mean, it was so serious. And, and, and I started it with a, a, a frontwards atom bomb, kind of as a, a statement of it, a tongue-in-cheek thing, really. And it ended with a backwards atom bomb. <laughs> In our post-Sergeant Pepper way, we had a, the uh, a, atomic bomb going off, the sound of it in, in the beginning, and then the end played backwards to kind of un, undo weaponry. 
Another song on the album did not make such a broad social statement. I Never Asked to Be Your Mountain was a far more personal song which Tim both composed and wrote the lyrics to. It is very ambitious and, and obviously confessional behind the symbols and uh, has a tremendous intensity that's mirrored in his performance. He infused this song, which was a kind of statement to his ex-wife, Mary, I never asked to be your mountain kind of got caught up in things and I'm sorry that I had to make my own way in the world and leave you behind with uh, our son. You know, you, you can quibble about whether he was rationalizing it or not, but this was his statement about, you know, why the two of them were not meant to be together and why he had to, had to leave. But it really kind of came alive in the studio and he did about 21 takes of it. And he sang every one of them full out, you know. And it was like the 21st take that we used, you know. And a lot of it was because, it wasn't because I, you know, I, there were a few times I said, that was pretty damn good, Tim. And he said, mm -hmm. he wasn't quite there yet. And uh, he went after it again. And he was singing his ass off. And, of course, Tim's thundering 12-string guitar really came to play a big role in that. He'd, he'd moved way ahead in terms of his own development on guitar and music. Uh, when he was singing that song, uh, I had never heard anybody approach the vocal power and technique and impassioned, almost visionary uh, ecstasy that he got while singing that song. So I never asked to be your mind. I have to rate as one of his very best all-time songs. Goodbye and Hello was finally released towards the end of 1967. To promote the album, Tim and his band embarked upon a tour, which included several dates in Britain. Here's Tim Buckley with Lee Underwood on guitar, Danny Thompson on bass, and Carter Collins on conga drums. A song which is composed by Tim Buckley is called I'm Coming Home Again. Goodbye and Hello, or a, an album that made a certain amount of a splash. I only found out about that splash years later. At the time, we were already working on other stuff. You know, we were we were writing Song to the Siren. Uh, 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 it, it wasn't a, we. The fact that it, it had come out in the stores, we didn't even know. The people were buying it, we didn't know. In what numbers, we didn't know. All right. So it, our, our, our focus was never on that. We never knew or cared. It was only the composition and the performance that was ever of interest. Here we come, walk down the street. We get the funniest looks from everyone we meet. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys, and people say we're monkey around. And the Monkees, you know, show, even though we look back on it as a sort of uh, goofy, sitcom-y knockoff of uh, Hard Day's Night, um, was a pretty musically adventurous show. I mean, especially as it went on, they had the freedom to just devote a little segment at the end of each show to a musical act that they liked, whether it was commercial or not. And one of those shows, they had Tim, and it's a pretty fascinating clip of you hear Mickey Dolenz basically say, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Buckley, out comes Tim, wearing very much his garb at the time, sort of a blue denim shirt and brown corduroys. He's got his guitar and he's singing song to the siren. This is Tim Buckley. It was the first uh, song worth keeping I ever wrote. He and I went to the studio and met all the monkeys and walked around. 
and I was standing just off camera as he was singing. And what did he choose to sing? Did he choose to sing one of his singles to promote it? No. Did he sing anything from Goodbye and Hello, a pretty good selling album that people might recognize, a song they might recognize? No. No, he sang his newest, edgiest, artiest song. And that tells you more about Tim right there than anything I can say. Tim's next album was to mark a drastic change in the direction of his music. He and Larry had stopped working together and Tim had become the sole lyricist as well as the songwriter. His music also began to move away from folk rock as he became increasingly influenced by jazz, and in particular the work of Miles Davis. He was a terrific model for Tim and, and myself. And so uh, I think Tim was also just naturally that way, but was encouraged by the example of Miles Davis to, to, be, to have artistic integrity and just pursue his own visions uh, wherever they might lead not really interested in being an entertainer, not interested in putting out product or getting on the charts or anything. Uh, if it all fell away, that wouldn't matter. The important thing was, was making great art. Tim evolved as an artist. Most artists find a sound and a style that comes from their sort of egoic presence and they stay with that and repeat that throughout their career. This sells. Tim, however, believed in change, growth, development, which is very interesting. So the leap between the second album, Goodbye and Hello, and the third album, Happy Sad, was just as great and just as dramatic as the leap between his first album, Tim Buckley, and his second album, Goodbye and Hello. Tim recruited a more jazz orientated band for the Happy Sad Sessions. With Jerry Esther once again producing the group, he headed into the studio in the winter of 1968. I think it's accurate to say that uh, Tim came into the studio with Happy Sad in a different frame of mind than he had when he was recording Goodbye and Low. On Goodbye and Low, producer Jerry Le Yester played a great role and did a magnificent job uh, handling the music, the arrangements, uh, handling the musicians in the studio, uh, working with different takes, uh, and generally overseeing the music and the performance of the music, and then, of course, all the technical stuff on the, uh, the board, recording the music. With Happy Sad, Tim wanted to move more into the first take domain spontaneity became a key word with him. He wanted to have that freshness and that vitality on songs that you get only in the first, maybe the second take. He didn't want to have uh, a producer overseeing details, creating arrangements, offering directions, guidance, suggestions. He wanted to do it his way. Happy Sad was an entirely different experience on both of our parts. and. Uh, Although it turned out, I think it turned out uh, a really good album. Uh, it was really painful to make, and uh, we weren't very close at all. And uh, <laughs> I don't think he liked the studio experience at all. I think he was getting a lot of bad advice um, from band members and like that. But uh, anyway, uh, it didn't take long. It took about a week. It was done. Happy Sad was released during April 1969. Despite its less than conventional sound, it quickly became Tim's most commercially successful record. I think it's a very effective mix of folk rock and the jazz he was obviously wanting to get into very much without sounding like a pretentious, I'm going to make a jazz record. It sounds like um, a blend of what he's good at or an addition of jazz influences, not having the jazz influences overwhelm what he's doing. 